I wanted to thank you so much for coming and giving us your time. Just, you know, we finished the film and I would like to just, if you could, say a few words about how you truly feel the importance of Ghazali is to us as both Muslim and non-Muslims. What's, what's really interesting to me, uh, Abdul Latif, is that when we did the film, when, when we did the interview and, and you and I were talking during a course of a time, you've been working on the film for a long time and we talked for a period of time about script and things like that. I think for me, I was really becoming much more acutely aware of just how important the film was, personally, uh, for a number of reasons. The first and most uh, important reason is I don't think we, I, I, I mean I can honestly say we do not know who Imam al-Ghazali was. The Muslims don't know who he was. We don't know who he was. This man is one of the most extraordinary human beings that ever lived. If you take all of recorded time, all the people that we know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the great Greeks, if you take the great uh, Hindu, the great Buddhist uh, sages, all these people that have left things behind, if you take all of the great Muslim sages, Imam al-Ghazali is in, in such a rarefied community. I mean, these people are a handful of people, and he's one of them. And knowing him at a, a deeper level, I think, is really important for the Muslim community, but I think it's also incredibly important for the, the, the non-Muslim community as well. Because this man is speaking to all of us. Imam al-Ghazali is speaking to the world and he's speaking to every man and every woman and his voice is a voice that has been drowned out in the modern world it's the voice of the sage Imam al-Ghazali talks about the, 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 the three elements of the soul that are in every human being the pig, the dog, and the sage and the pig and the dog the, you know, the, the, the pig is squealing and the dog is barking today but we're not hearing the sage and, and he is that voice. He's the voice of the sage. And he's really challenging us to get control of the pig and the dog. Because while they're important to our souls, they're there for a reason. The, the concupiscent soul, what, what's called the, uh, the lustful soul, and the irascible soul, they're important, those elements of the soul. But the rational soul, the spiritual component within man, is, is that's the element that's so sorely missing in the current uh, scenario. So in terms of um, the spiritual development of man, I mean, do you think that Al-Ghazali's life is the, the epitome of that search? Well, one of the things that Al-Ghazali, Imam Al-Ghazali did is that he he really introduced a concept even though I mean the concept has been there from the start he introduced it in a way that that the, that's really quite unique in the in the Muslim tradition he introduces the concept of the wayfarer the sadik and and he extends that concept beyond the Muslim community he 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 literally describes the entire planet as wayfarers that we're all wayfarers and this is essentially in, in the Christian tradition, it's the voice of Dante. Dante's uh, Divine Comedy is, is really about the wayfarer, that you are on an individual journey to God. And, and Dante's talking about himself. The, in the middle of my life, I, I found myself in a dark wood, and I was lost. And then he talks about the leopard, the lion, these elements of the soul. And then he goes through hell. Because you have to go through hell, the hell of the world. And then to realize what the world is calling you to, if you answer the call of the world. And then he goes to the, the mountain of purgatory and that purif purification that has to take place. But it has to be an active, it has to be a conscious effort. There's a great scene in the, in the purgatorio where uh, I think his name is Castel, uh, Casello. He's, he's a singer. And Dante loved him, 
when he was in, in the world. And, uh, and he, he, he says, sing me a song, because he loved his voice. And Casello begins to sing, and all of the, the pilgrims that are about to embark on the Mount of, of Purgatory, climb to ascend this mountain, um, they all become completely entranced. And suddenly Virgil r runs, at, when he's seeing this happen, he runs and he, he says, what are you doing? You're not here to do this. You, this is what you left behind. You've got this huge mountain. You're not here to entertain yourselves anymore. It's a wonderful moment in the Purgatorio that is really at the root of what Imam, Imam al-Ghazali is that Virgil character. Mm. He, he's, he's coming and he's, he's shaking you out of your sleep and he's saying, wake up. You've been sleeping too long. You've enjoyed the sleep for too long. It's time to wake up because if you don't wake up now, you're going to wake up to a nightmare. And that nightmare is that you've wasted your life. And that's why his Imam al-Ghazali to me has an immediacy. When I read, and I read him literally, I've been reading him almost every night. And he's just, he's got an immediacy. He makes me, and, and the beauty of it is, he talks about his own, how he was putting off the journey. He, that he was struggling within his own soul. He was putting off the journey. So he's telling you, look, I was doing this, and then God forced it upon me. He took away my ability to speak. And that was my livelihood. Because he was a genius, and he was brilliant. And then the other thing about Al-Ghazali that really strikes me is... He was, a, he was a master of so many fields, and his books are still the definitive books in those fields. His book on uh, constitutional law, which is called al Mustasfa, which is really usul al-fiqh, it's the methodology of, of legal derivation, it's still considered the acme of the Islamic legal tradition. It really is. And, and that's his book. That's one aspect of his life, that intellectual endeavor. Mm -hmm. So. Imam al-Ghazali was writing in that, he, he wrote, and it was new, it was original. His teacher, al Joani was an original thinker, but Imam al-Ghazali extended that thought. And one of the things that he, he really dis disdained was the imitative mind. He, he did not like taqlid. He did not like this idea of blind imitation. He was challenging people, think for yourself. You need to, you need to, this has to be true for you. It can't be true because your father told you it's true. It can't be true because your society tells you it's true. It has to be true for you. And the only way it's going to be true for you is if you take it seriously enough to think about it. So that, that's what, that what he's doing. This is, in fact, um, a result of his first crisis, which was one of doubt and skepticism, I, I think. That's what he went, the dark night of the soul. He, he experienced that in a real way. And he was honest enough not to become a fanatic because what many people do when they have that crisis is that they they actually they either lose their faith or they become fanatics because the fanatic is somebody who his zealousness will create such internal agitation that he never his soul is never still enough to have the doubts that's the born again but without having uh, experienced well it's yeah the the first birth didn't take place was stillborn, spiritual, st yeah. spiritual stillborn. Yeah. Now, if we can just talk a little bit about the film. I mean, obviously, I put it, what I could into it. Uh, obviously, some scenes. Uh, maybe. I, th I think one of the criticisms that some of the people had that we've uh, shown the film is is that he didn't seem happy, which to me is missing the point entirely. It's a very superficial reading of the film. The man that portrays Imam al-Ghazali in the film, he's obviously a brilliant actor, but the man that portrays the film was portraying a state. And the state that he was portraying was one of what the Sufis called jid, of absolute seriousness. Absolute seriousness does not, there's a few times he smiles in the film, but not very often. Absolute seriousness is not a, a morbid approach to life. It is a very intense approach to life. Intense people are difficult to be around for a lot of people because most people aren't very intense. Most people don't take their lives that seriously. 
um, p some people become witty about it. Some people uh, become cynical. Some people uh, become boring. I mean, there's a lot of strategies that people use to deal with the basic phenomenon of mortality, of the fact that we're here, we're going to die. And death is very real and very present. Death is present in every moment. And, and embracing seriousness is really embracing mortality. It's, it's, you know, it's what Heidegger called the being unto death. It's, it's, it's accepting that you're going to die. And it's not becoming morbid about it. It's, I need to prepare because this journey is coming. And that's really what Imam al-Ghazali is doing. And I think that's what you were trying to get out in the, in the film is that he was serious. And he's telling us, this thing's too important. Don't miss this opportunity because you only get it one time. Muslims aren't Hindus, That's you know. True. I mean, it, there's 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 not a second chance, and and what you do here is is going to return to you in the next life. And and the other thing, Imam al Ghazali. One of the things I really I was reading, in fact, just a few days ago in Mizan al Amal. I was on the airplane, and, and I couldn't put that book down. I just got a critical edition in Egypt, so I was reading it. And one of the things that he said, he said, if we look at what all human beings are looking for, they're all looking for happiness. That's it. You know, in, in my country's foundational, well, you also, you're from the States, but in our foundational document, which is the Declaration of Independence, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, all men are born with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and it's interesting because the, that original statement, according to Locke, John Locke, who originally made that statement, said, and the pursuit of property. But Jefferson was a, a metaphysician. He had a, a, a more of a metaphysician's metaphys mind than an empiricist. You know, Locke was more in the, the empiricist tradition. Jefferson understood that really that, that is the fundamental human reality, is the search for happiness. Now we have different definitions of happiness, and Imam al-Ghazali goes through each one of them. Some people define happiness as pleasure, but like the Buddhists say, the problem with pleasure is that every earthly pleasure is only temporary. So when, I, when I'm eating, I have the pleasure of food. But it, it comes to an end, and I can't just keep eating because I get I get full. I get and I'll actually get sick if I keep eating. The pleasure uh, of sexuality comes to an end, and and it's over. And then again, I can't keep doing it because the body can't take it. It's as simple as that. And the pleasure of sleep. Somebody said. You know, what is the pleasure of sleep? Is it when you're sleeping? Well, it can't be because you're asleep. So is it before sleep? And then it's not really the pleasure of sleep. Is it after sleep? Then it's not really the pleasure of sleep. So what is it? But we all recognize sleep as a pleasurable thing, the gentle tyrant. So he looks at all these things, and then he quotes Imam Ali, and he said, what, you know, what a wondrous thing the world is. The, the greatest, there's only five things that everybody really takes derives pleasure in uh, drink food scent cloth and uh, and and sexuality and he said um, in the sensory thing I mean there's companionship and things like that th those are different but he's talking about senses and so he says the highest drink is water and he said it's al ashya it's the least of things in the world he said the highest food is the vomit of bees, honey. He said the, the highest cloth is the excrement of worms, which is silk. And then he said the, 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 the highest um, smell is the mucus of a gazelle, the musk odor. And then he said, and, and the greatest pleasure in the world is the meeting of the two urinary tracts. So, <laughs> there's the world. Mm -hmm. that, so he said that can't be what happiness is. It can't, it can't, that can't be the ultimate 
If it is, I mean, it's, it, it's you know, a real trick's being played on us. And, and, then, and then he looks at, at um, uh, position and wealth and power and all these other things that people pursue. And again, he says the problem with them is, is that beauty is, is an intangible. It's in the eye of the beholder. It's something that we can lose at any moment. Uh, it's something that the more you examine it, the, the, the more elusive it is. You know, if, if you see a beautiful woman, like Dr. Niqib al-Attas said, if you see a beautiful woman, and, and you, you take a magnifying glass to try to get a closer look, and suddenly you're at the level of pores. She's, she's no longer beautiful. She's porous. So all of those aspects that people consider happiness. So he says, in the end, what is happiness? Happiness is virtue. Happiness is, is living a virtuous life. And he says, and, and virtue is predicated on knowledge, and action, right knowledge, and right action. And that's where Imam al-Ghazali is also very extraordinary, is he, one of the things that he hated, Imam al-Ghazali hated the sectarian mind. And the reason he hated the sectarian mind is because he felt this, the sectarian mind's sickness was it, it was provincial. Uh, the sectarian mind always focuses on one area or aspect and grabs on to that and won't let go. Uh, Churchill described the fanatic as somebody who wouldn't change his mind and wouldn't change the subject. And, that, and that's, that's, the, that's the mind that Ghazali hated. And another aspect, because he was a philosopher, in the real true sense of the word, you know, philosophia, the lover of wisdom, he was somebody that was willing to examine a question to its utmost. He wanted to take it as far as you could take it. And because he was willing to do that, if you wanted to talk to him about it, you better have done the same thing. Because if you hadn't, he wasn't going to waste his time. He didn't suffer fools gladly. He, he did not suffer fools gladly because he had done the work and he expected his interlocutor to, to have done the work as well. And if you weren't willing to do the work, he, he just, he wasn't going to waste his time. He had other things to do. And, and so that, that's an aspect of him that's really extraordinary, is that he, his, his mind was very vast, but he was also, he had a large S. Um, he, he, he wanted to understand all of these different groups, the botanist and the materialist and, and, and the philosophers. In fact, some people criticized his book, Maqasid al-Falasifa, which is the ends or aims of the philosophers, because they said that he had understood them so well and then facilit facilitated their thought by explaining them better than they could themselves. Mm -hmm. So he, in turn, allowed people to have access to their ideas that would not normally have access to their ideas. So he was actually criticized for making the, the, the Greek philosophical thought easier to understand. That was one of, the, that was a particular genius that he had of really being able to clarify things. So he says, if happiness then is, is knowledge and action, he says what's really intriguing is for the otherworldly happiness, it's the same. So whether you want worldly happiness or otherworldly happiness, they both are predicated upon knowledge and action. And he said because uh, people that don't have knowledge uh, are, are always pursuing things that will lead to unhappiness. Because they don't have knowledge. Most people, you ask most people in the world, uh, what do you want? People will always tell you means. They'll never tell you ends. They'll say, I want money. But then if you press it a little further, well, why do you want money? Um, so I can do what I want. Well, why do you want to do what you want? Mm, so I, I, I don't feel I'm having any constraints. Well, why don't you want to feel like you're having constraints? Because I want to feel free. Well, why do you want to feel you're free? Well, I, I want to be happy. So when you get to happiness, it's not a means to anything. It's an end in and of itself. And that's what he was saying, is that most people are preoccupied with, with means and they've forgotten the end of life. Mm. And he was telling us, turn away from the means and seek the end. I mean, that's really at the crux and the heart of his philosophy. Now, uh, in the film, I, I tried to, to show that as a result of his um, position and uh, at the time of, of he, that he was living, a lot of people sort of 
put him in, in, a, in a position of, 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 they were looking up to him and he, he started taking on a kind of persona that wasn't truly who he was. And, and he became, I yeah, guess, no, that's, arrogant. Yeah, right? arrogant, right. Well, that's the false self, the ego. And, and one of the most difficult things in the world is to be real. And, and ultimately, that's what he was pursuing, is al-haq. You know, the word in Arabic for reality, it's very interesting. Our word in English, reality, is from res, which means thing in Latin. So our word for reality is already predicated on materialism, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. The word for thing in Arabic is that which is willed into existence. Shay. Sha'a shay'an. He willed a thing. Mm -hmm. So shay is already the word, it, has, it reveals itself as something that has a source. Now the word in Arabic for reality is haqiqa. And the root of that is haq, which is real, real. It is reality. And it's also a name of God. It's also the word for rights the right of a person, a haq, his right. So, reality to Imam al-Ghazali is the world that the veil has been lifted. And the veil of the there are many veils. The most primary veil is the sensory veil, that we're veiled by the senses, because the senses are so powerful, and we're so attracted to form, uh, which is why idolatry has always been the primary form of worship because we need forms, we need tangibles. And, and one of the, you know, the Islamic, all the Abrahamic tradition, but, but the Islamic tradition, because it has radical monotheism, it's really asking people to conceive of the inconceivable. It's asking a finite creature to embrace the infinite. Yes. So it's, it's, it's very, the absolute. it's the absolute, and, 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 and we're relative creatures. But we're, we're asked to embrace the absolute. So that is, is actually a really difficult thing to do. It's very difficult. So his desire to, to achieve truth, reality, to really have those veils removed, that's what, that's what he was about. And his book, Munqid Min al he mentions several times that this takes work. Um, the Confucius, the Confucius have a, one of their primary texts is called "Knowledge Painfully Acquired." Um, pe people used to, if you look at the Christian, early Christian church fathers, they were all off in caves in Egyptian deserts in the Sinai. I mean, that's how intense, and that's why it all resonates to this day. It's the work that they did. That's the only reason why these religions are still around today. It's not because of what people are doing today. It's because of what they did. It's because of people like Imam al-Ghazali that they're still Muslims. Because they were willing to, to really do that work. It was incredibly hard work. It's hard work, but that's the nature of reality. Imam al-Ghazali has a wonderful, um, it's a very short uh, letter that he wrote uh, called Al-Anqa. And the Anqa is the phoenix. It's, it's, uh, you know, it, it's the western phoenix, the Anqa Mughrib. Uh, it, it was a bird that they believed only appeared once every 500 years. But in, in the story, and he, it's a literary motif that he's using called a maqama. But in the story, he, he, he talks about how everything in the, in, in the world has kings. The ants have kings, the queens have kings. The, the, bird, the, 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 the bees. The bees have queens. The birds all get together and say, we don't have a king. We need to go find the king. Who's the king of the birds? It must be the Anka. And so they all set out to find the bird. It's an incredibly difficult journey. They're, they're having a horrible time. There's, there's storms, there's wind, there's all these things. And it's so difficult. And they all want to give up. But they keep going. They help each other. And they support each other. That's the idea of the ecclesia in, 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 in Orthodox Christianity, the church, the minion in Judaism, the jama'a in Arabic, it's the community of believers. It's this idea of people actually helping each other, reminding each other to stay on the spiritual path because it's so easy to fall away. One of the wonderful things about birds is that when they fly in their winged migrations, when they fly, they fly in these formations, the first one his wings, their movement, creates an actual space 
in the in the air that makes it lighter for the next ones those then uh, work their wings that makes it lighter for the next ones the ones at the very ends have a very light trip so what they do is they rotate and and it, it enables them to make transcontinental migrations they literally cross the ocean people forget that that birds cross the ocean but they do it working together and that's the metaphor that he's using to search for God that this is a collective work. it's private work each one's doing his own job but it's also a collective work and this is the fraternity the, of, of you know the brothers and the sisters that that are willing to do that work and to help each other and to know that not only are they going to stumble on the path and trip uh, they're they're also going to have doubts on the path they're going to have there's a lot of things that are going to happen uh, but in the end what's beautiful in this is that the birds when they finally meet the phoenix and and they're like look how we've struggled so and 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 the phoenix says do you think i would have invited people that weren't willing to make those journey uh, those difficulties and and they're all like well we did it ourselves see that's still the ego the, the ego hasn't given up mm -hmm. the last thing to go according to imam al ghazali is love of leadership it's the ego it's the me i did this look at me i'm right at the door of god and and he says you can't get in until you give even that up and so he, he, he mapped it out. And now the other thing that's very profound about Imam al Ghazali, I think, is that he's reminding us that this is science. It's science. This is experimental science. You want the results? Just replicate the, uh, the experiment and you'll get the same results. You want to know God? Here's the path. I've mapped it out for you. Set out on the journey. I promise. Mansara al-Dar wasal. If you set out on the journey, you'll arrive.